Good evening, everybody, and welcome to tonight's Facebook Live. My name is Alec. I'm the Managing Director for Wound Care People and the Journal of Community Nursing. Uh, this evening's session is Diagnosing and Managing Venous Eczema with Confidence. And our speakers are uh, Dr. Leanne Atkin, who's a lecturer practitioner, University of Huddersfield, vascular nurse consultant at Mid York's NHS Trust, and Sharon Gardner, who's a clinical specialist at HR Healthcare. Uh, ladies, I'll come over to you in just a moment. Just firstly, I just want to say thank you very much to HR for uh, supporting this event. Um, this is the first time we've done anything on Venus Exma, and it's not something I know a lot about, so I'm certainly uh, looking forward to it. Uh, Leanne and Sharon, how are you? Are you looking forward to this evening? Good, thank you. Yes, very, very excited Brilliant. to be here. Brilliant. Okay, so for all you watching at home, just uh, the usual, uh, the, the the usual housekeeping. Uh, you can see that we're working from home. Um, I will say this right from the start: we've been, uh, we we if we do get any technical issues, bear with us because we've just been working on some now. But I think they're all fixed. Uh, so uh, so fingers crossed. Uh, these events always work better if you ask uh, as many questions as you can. Engage with your colleagues from across the country in the chat box. Uh, as the presentation is going on, do send us as many questions as you can, because after the presentation, as always, we'll be coming back for a live Q&A uh, with myself, Sharon, and uh, and Leanne to answer all of those questions for you. Um, again, as always, certificates will be available at the end via a link that we'll put into the comments section, as well as a slide on the, uh, on the presentation. Uh, I think that's it from me. I'm going to hand over to you, Leanne and Sharon, to start. Once you've finished, I'll come back and we can uh, we, we can see all the questions that have come in. So good luck and I shall catch up with you shortly. Thank you. So good evening, everybody. Um, and thank you, Alec, for the kind introduction. Um, I'm here with Sharon, um, who's the clinical specialist from LNR Healthcare. Um, I'm going to give you a brief overview, really, about the broader aspects in terms of the pathophysiology of venous eczema. And then Sharon's going to come in at the end and provide some specific products information. And then we're both going to be here for any question and answers. So please, please keep those question and answers coming. Oh, sorry, keep those questions coming. And we will hopefully answer them all at the end of this. So as Alex said, I'm a vascular nurse um, consultant. And so I work in Leg Ulcer Clinic still three days a week. And this session really hopefully is going to give you that confidence when you're treating patients with venous eczema. So where do we begin? So, so what is venous eczema? So really um, eczema of any type is a inflammatory reaction of the skin. And within terms of venous eczema, it's characterized by that red, itchy, scaly or flaky skin, which you can occasionally get some blistering with. If you see this clinical image here on this screen, that is classic venous eczema. You can see the redness in places and the irritation. You can see that scaly, flaky skin, especially around the periphery. And in that central piece, you can see that you've actually lost the top epithelial surface. So you're going to be getting that uh, serous drainage, that golden exudate from the centre of that. And all of that will be terribly itchy and terribly uncomfortable for the patient. That's classic venous eczema on the lower limb, on that gator region where you used to wear your um, uh, ankle warmers and especially of the medial aspect, the inner aspect of the leg. That's the classic place where venous eczema occurs. So venous eczema has a number of names and you may well have heard these being used. It can also be described as varicose eczema, gravitational eczema, status eczema, status dermatitis, varicose dermatitis. Um, Sometimes within healthcare, I don't think it's helpful that we use so many words that mean the same. Don't worry about using the word dermatitis on eczema. You can use them interchangeably. They sort of mean the same thing. In terms of the venous side, obviously you can get different types of eczema, uh, you know, whether it's an allergic reaction or whether it's simply a atopical eczema. With the venous side, the venous, the varicose, the gravitational, the status, all means the same thing. It's all related to the problem in terms of the venous hypertension causing this irritation within those subcutaneous legs. Why does it happen? Well, it happens because of that sustained venous hypertension. In fact, venous eczema occurs for the same reasons why venous leg ulcer occurs. 
And it's really interesting that if you have a venous leg ulcer, unsurprisingly, because the pathophysiological results are the same, a high proportion of patients with a venous leg ulcer will also have some evidence of venous eczema. And it's really important that you're able to distinguish between venous leg ulceration and venous eczema because the treatments of these are very different. For a venous leg ulcer, you'd be thinking about that primary dressing with compression. With venous eczema, we need to be thinking about a topical preparation along with that compression. And hopefully, by the end of this session today, all of this will become a little clearer and you'll have great confidence in diagnosing that venous eczema. So there are significant complications though that can come with venous eczema, which shouldn't just poo-poo the fact that it's just eczema. In fact, you know, a lot of this can be terribly painful for a patient. You can see on this clinical image that if eczema isn't sorry, if eczema isn't well controlled, you can start to get larger areas of that surface skin loss, resulting in exudate coming. And some of these areas of venous eczema with that superficial skin loss can have high volumes of exudate uh, coming from there. And once you get those high volumes of exudate and that break in that epithelial surface, you've got huge risk of infection. Specifically, with venous eczema, I think the common infections is Staph aureus. Fungal infections are very common indeed, and also is Pseudomonas. But with this, once you've got that eczema, we really need to treat it quickly, because if not, you can end up with permanent skin damage, which can affect a patient's body image. You can increase the risk of that contact dermatitis because that skin is already in an inflamed state and therefore it can easily become reactive to certain type of products that's put on. So contact dermatitis is the same as contact eczema. It's an allergic reaction of that skin. And ultimately, if you look at that image, you can see why that patient's at high risk of ulceration. We've got that superficial um, skin loss of the epithelial layer it wouldn't take much more to turn that into a classic venous leg ulcer. Especially with those high volumes of exudate, that's a real issue. So we need to be treating these very quickly and appropriately. So what causes venous eczema? Well, venous eczema occurs for the same reason that you get venous ulceration. It's all linked to this venous hypertension. So We've got to remember what is venous hypertension. Well, it's those damage to those valves often within the veins or the blood flow back up to the heart. So what you tend to get is you get backflow within the superficial veins, the ones that you can see on the outside of the leg. As you get backflow, you get dilatation and therefore you get leakage of the skin, of the, of the blood products into the surrounding skin. So what are the blood products that we talk about? Well, if you remember back from your basic training, there's three components of blood. Number one is plasma. So when you get that dilatation and the leakage of the plasma from the blood vessel into the surrounding tissue, you get edema. The second product of blood is red blood cells. When they start to leak out into the subcutaneous tissue, your body tries to break them down and it's able to break down them all apart from the hemoglobin molecule. And the hemoglobin molecule is made of iron. So you start to get that brown skin staining as those red blood products have been leaked. But it's ultimately, it's the white blood cells that's contained within the blood which causes the biggest issue. When you start to release the white blood cells, which is part of our immune response, into that surrounding tissue, you get this chronic inflammation. You get this activation of cytokines, which causes more white cells to come and causes more activation. And that's what causes the inflammation, the irritation of the skin, and ultimately the areas of ulceration. And again, you can see on this image that the classic picture of venous eczema happening on that retromalleolus below the malleolus and at the side of the malleolus, the ankle bone. 
you can see that skin irritation. That is classic venous eczema. So I believe for you to understand venous eczema, you really need to understand the anatomy of the body. I am a great believer in closing your eyes and picturing what's going on in terms of a pathophysiological point of view, what's happening, what's going wrong within that body. So let's just recap a few bits of this. So the arterial system is the system that feeds the blood from the heart down to the toes. It goes through the aorta, through the iliac arteries, down the femoral artery, down the superficial femoral artery, down in your thigh, through the popliteal at the bottom of the back of your leg, and then down the three vessels that run into your foot, the anterior tibial, the posterior tibial, and the perineal. And that's what causes forms the foot arch, if you like, of the lower limb circulation. Remember, it's not a closed circulation, so it doesn't go down the veins and then, sorry, down the arteries and straight up the veins. There's a connective mechanism that connects the arteries and the veins called the capillary bed. But once the blood is passed through the capillary bed, it then gets sucked back up through the venous system, going straight back up through those posterior tibial, anterior tibial veins, through hope with the popliteal vein, the greater venous vein, back up into your iliac vein, into your vena cava, and then part of that circulatory system. Now, there's a lot of names there, and you don't need to remember all of them. But what I just want you to know is really, there's a complex structure of blood supply and blood return. We do need to see them as two separate systems, though, when we're thinking about how to manage a patient with this type of disease. But it's this is the most important. It's the capillary network. This is the bit where the gaseous exchange takes place. And this is the bit that becomes high risk of leakage of those blood products into that surrounding tissue. So what can happen is that you can get a back pressure within those veins. And you can imagine if you've got a back pressure within those veins, you get a further push of that capillary network, really pushing those blood products into that surrounding tissue. So we really need to ensure that our venous system is able to take the blood back up to the circulatory volume as it needs to. So how does blood return from your feet? I think it's really interesting that if I ask you how does blood get down to your feet, it's easy, isn't it? It's that great big boiler, that great big pump that forces that blood down and shoots it down to our most distal aspect. But there is no such pumping mechanism to get the blood from the veins back up to the heart. This isn't a closed system, so we're not getting any effect of that heart contraction to help us with this. So the way that the blood moves really is two main mechanisms. The first main mechanism is actually the calf muscle pump. And what happens is that as the muscle activates, it squeezes those deep veins and therefore it sucks the blood from the superficial system into the deep system through a negative pressure. And it pushes and expels that blood back up through the, through the veins, back up into that circulatory volume. And the thing that makes this work well is these non-return valves. So there's a valve within the vein that opens as the blood's going up, but closes quickly when the blood has, has gone through the gate, if you like. And therefore it doesn't allow the blood to go backwards. So every 10 centimeters within the veins of your leg, you've got a valve and it's like a chunking of blood in sections back up to your heart. And that's how venous return should happen. This contraction of this calf muscle pump, there's a little bit of force from the diaphragm because as you breathe in, you get a little bit of a negative pressure. So it helps to pull some of that blood back up. So that's how it should happen. But the problem is, is once you start to get damage within a valve, you start to get actually increased amount of pressure. We have to remember that the veins are a low pressure system. They're not like an artery that can take 120 milligrams of force on its muscular walls. These veins have got a very thin muscular wall. They don't like pressure at all. They can easily start to dilate. 
many of you out there may well have varicose veins. If you're in your 30s, you may not have them yet, but have a look at your mum and dad's legs. If they've got varicose veins, varicose veins is coming your way. They are hereditary. But varicose veins are common and they're simply because of this uh, non-valve function, venous insufficiency, we call it. So hopefully this works well, but the problem is, is once the veins start to fail, we end up with a cycle of venous hypertension. So once you get that valvular incompetence, we get that more uh, pressure from those veins we get a higher column of blood, causing the veins to start to dilate. When the veins start to dilate, we lose even more incompetence of those valves because the valves can't simply join together anymore because of the distension of the vein. When the veins start to distend, they allow more blood products to leak into the surrounding tissue because of the change of the hydrostatic pressure. And all of this starts to weaken the vessel walls so making them more at risk of bagging and therefore valvular failure. And all of this leads to a chronic inflammatory response causing this continuous problem, this activations of the cytokines, the problems in terms of the activation of the white blood cells, the release of this ferritin and haemoglobin causing this increased pigments, and along with that, inflammatory response that re leads to those activations of those MMPs, which all causes this cycle of venous inflammation. So what you need to know is once you've got venous hypertension, you need to think about stopping it as soon as possible because this is only going to progress and get worse. But who's at risk of venous disease? Well, as I said, actually, um, a lot of it is hereditary. You are more likely to get skin changes because of venous disease as you're aging, as you get older. That's because the pressure of the veins and the veins become baggier over time. And additionally, the skin slightly thins, you slightly lose a subcutaneous layer. Therefore, you can see more of the changes with the pigmentation. Much more likely in terms of problems with obesity or immobility. If you've got visible varicosities on your leg, by default, you've got venous hypertension. If you've had a history of previous DVT, so a blood clot within the deep venous system, you will have potentially increased back pressures to the superficial venous system. And again, if you've got any issues in terms of cellulitis or ulceration in the past, you're highly likely to have venous hypertension. So, I may have scared some of you by saying that um, you may have varicose veins. What I want to reassure you is just because you've got varicose veins doesn't mean you're going to end up with venous eczema and a venous leg alteration. We've got thousands and thousands of patients out there with venous, uh, with varicose veins. Within vascular, we use a tool called the CEAP classification system to help to identify the severity of disease. And this is linked to what we should be doing in terms of intervention. So you can start off with those spider veins uh, that might look unsightly, but have nothing to worry about whatsoever. That's not real uh, venous hypertension. But you get that C2 where you start to get that visible varicosities and you will have a degree of valvular incompetence. What happens next is you get the edema. Stage four is when you start to get the skin changes in terms of the pigmentation. C5 is where you've got that inflammatory reaction of the skin. And ultimately, that can lead to C6 in terms of the venous ulceration. So venous eczema really is part of this continuum of venous disease. And, and there is certainly a linear relationship between the severity of venous disease and the clinical symptoms that you get. But it doesn't mean just because you've got varicose veins, you're going to end up with a venous leg ulcer one day. But certainly the nice recommendations say that if you've got a patient with C4, 5 or 6, those patients should be assessed for venous incompetence. And we'll go on to that in a little while. So what are the signs and symptoms of venous um, hypertension? Well, they're very similar to what you'll find with venous eczema and venous leg ulceration. 
patients can report an aching sensation or a burning sensation, especially when they've been on their feet for a long period of time or for the week coming up to menstruation, if they're female or during menstruation. Those increased amounts of uh, progesterone can really affect these symptoms. Patients often report of a feeling of heaviness, of pain. They can get some swelling. Many patients find that it's extremely itchy and that can be their one symptom that they're desperate to get rid of. But many patients simply don't like the visible varicosities. The skin changes, especially when you start to have hemosiderin staining on very pale skin. It can be problematic. And obviously the ultimate sign is that of venous ulceration. So what do you do if you've got a patient with a venous eczema? Well, it's exactly the same as what you do with a patient with a venous leg ulcer. It's about assessing the patient, the limb and the wound. And what you're trying to do is you are trying to use your diagnostic skills to help to determine what is the underlying pathophysiology. When we talk about lower legs, there's two main pathophysiologies. Problems with that arterial supply leading to arterial insufficiency, peripheral arterial disease, and problems with the venous return leading to the venous hypertension, venous eczema, and venous leg ulceration. I like breaking down assessments into this stage approach. Ask the patient, look at the limb, and then finally look at the wound or the skin. So in terms of when you're looking at this patient, who's most likely to get what? If you've got a patient with high um, body mass index, previous DVT, has got visible varicose veins or tells you that they've had varicose vein intervention in the past, they're highly likely to have problems with venous uh, hypertension. But if you've got a patient who's telling you that they've got angina, um, uh, they've had strokes, if they've had heart attacks, all of this is due to atheroma, stirring up of the blood vessels, that's arterial disease. If they're a smoker, if they're a diabetic, if they've got hypertension, they're more likely to get that atheroma. And obviously, if you've got any patients in terms of giving you history of having angioplasty, angiograms of their legs, arterial stenting or bypass operations, those patients definitely have a degree of arterial disease. And just watch out for those patients describing that history of intermittent claudication. So that pain that they can describe at the back of the leg during periods of exercise, that can be a hint to say that that patient's got arterial insufficiency. Intermittent claudication is a real easy thing to diagnose. It's a pain that's induced by exercise, only comes on at exercise, is relieved by rest, and the patient will never get it when they're sat down or when they're in bed on a night time. So learning additional skills um, in terms of diagnosis can be helpful. So that's assessing the patient for those signs and symptoms. And then it's thinking about the limb. And there's the same sort of two assessments with this. It's really thinking about what is this leg looking like? If they've got shiny skin, hairless skin with thickened nails, there's a problem with the nutrients. There's a problem with that blood supply. Often if they've got arterial pay, if they've got arterial wound, more than likely it's gonna be on the foot rather than on the leg. Not exclusively, but more likely. Most arterial ulcers are extremely painful. Just a caveat there, if you've got neuropathy from diabetes, the patient may not experience that pain. But quite often we find that the, we have what we call a sunset foot. So we get arterial flushing where the blood vessels have got full maximum vasodilation, trying to get every drop of blood that's coming its way down to those tissues. So the foot can look inflamed and red, and sometimes people say it looks infected, but it's not. It's simple arterial flushing. And you can simply um, determine that by elevating the, the leg to the level of the hip. If that um, discoloration disappears, it's because of flushing. If that discoloration stays the same, it's probably due to infection. If you imagine if you've had an infection, it doesn't matter where you put that leg, it will remain red. It's that vasodilation that you can see if you elevate that leg. 
The opposite exists for venous disease. In general, if you've got problems with venous hypertension, you will have that edema, that skin staining. You will have dry eczema to skin. You can have that inflammation around the gaiter. So the leg itself looks okay, but you've actually got that redness happening around that gaiter region. You can then develop the lipoderma sclerosis where the skin starts to go thickened and wood-like. And ultimately, you can develop that area of ulceration. But to me, one of the greatest tips of determining the limb is just have a look a bit higher up. Have a look at the thigh. If you can see visible varicosities in the legs, it's probably going to be venous in nature. But ultimately, when we talk about assessment of the limb, this has to include an assessment such as an ankle brachial pressure index or a toe pressure to really determine the arterial status of that leg. That really helps you to actually classify whether this is venous disease or arterial disease. And then finally, it's about thinking about the wound. I know this session is about venous, or, uh, venous eczema, but actually I think it's really important that you're able to determine the difference between a venous ulcer and an arterial ulcer. That is a classic venous ulcer. It's on the medial gator, it's irregular, it's shallow. Classic venous leg ulcer. And that's a classic arterial ulcer, round, punched out on the lower limb, and it's developed quickly and it's extremely painful. I'd love to say that they're all as black and white as those two, but they're not. You can find that actually the wound itself mimics a venous or an arterial. And that's why the wound assessment has to come last. It has to be built on that holistic patient assessment, the assessment of the limb, and then the assessment of the wound. So just like um, with venous ulceration, with venous eczema, I hope you're hearing that actually all of this is related to the veins. And actually what we need to do is we need to treat the venous hypertension. So not treating the dandelion that you see in terms of that skin irritation, but you actually treat the roots of that weed, if you like, which is within that uh, venous system. And to do that, we need venous assessment and good compression therapy. But when it comes to treatment of venous eczema, we really need to consider what topical preparations are we putting on the skin? Because if you were just to put a compression bandage on a patient with a leg like that, they're gonna find it itchy, uncomfortable and you're going to have problems with adherence of that compression bandage. So we need to be thinking both the venous side but also the skin side in combination. I just want to give you a little bit of a shout out to say that the best way to cure venous hypertension is actually to operate on it um, because actually once you operate on it you cure that problem with those veins and those valves. Every patient with venous eczema and venous ulceration should have a venous duplex scan done in a department as such as a vascular service. And what we're trying to do is determine whether that there is any reflux within the venous system. That far right image is an ultrasound image. You can see at the top is the superficial venous system. At the bottom is the deep venous system. And there should be a valve, a non-return gate, if you like, between these systems. But as you can see, you've got backflow happening. So we've got pressure from the deep system going down those superficial veins. And that's why we're getting the symptoms that the patient's describing. And when I talk about treatment of these, it's not invasive surgery. Majority of vascular venous intervention that happens across the UK now is what we call minimally invasive. The number one recommended treatment is that of radiofrequency ablation. We simply cannulate the vein, put a catheter up the vein, burn the vein, the vein collapses on itself and we can have fantastic results in terms of you can go from having significant visible varicosities causing skin changes to elimination of those veins. It's very minimally invasive, walk in, walk out, local um, anaesthetic and patients can go back to work the same day. So we have to think about the treatment of the venous hypertension. We actually, if you're a nurse out there, we need to really start this patient on compression. 
because actually you're not going to get that patient to be seen in vascular within a week or two and they might not get the varicose vein operation for many months due to the COVID backlog. So you need to tick that box in terms of thinking of that, but then you need to think, how can I control that venous hypertension here and now with that patient? And actually what you need is good compression. But like I said, this has to come at the same time as good, some good skin care. All of these pictures that you see here is ranges of venous eczema. You can see that classic venous eczema on the far left, that irritated venous eczema on the front of the shin is secondary mostly to the edema, or the irritation is there. The poorly controlled venous eczema on the third picture leading to that leakage of that um, high volumes of serous fluid. And that final picture of terrible venous eczema, which has caused significant discomfort for the patient. And because of the therapies that we didn't get right in combination with the itching, we have this terrible skin. And actually, if I look at that, probably third and fourth picture along that line, would I allow you to put a compression bandage on, even though you might explain to me that's what I need? Probably not, because it's going to make my symptoms worse. And this is why the compression has to be in combination with good skin care, because if not, your patients simply are not going to tolerate it. When I talk about compression, there's loads of options available. It's really looking at that patient, that limb, and what you're trying to treat in terms of what you are going to use. We know you need strong compression. We know that that can be delivered through multi-layer bandages, four layer or two layers. Those bandage kits in terms of those two layers. It can be delivered by that compression hosiery kit, those that provide the 40 milligrams of mercury pressure. And there is an increasing use of compression wrap systems in this area. Uh, there is a multi-center randomized control trial going on at the moment to say whether compression wrap systems are as good as the compression hosiery kits and the multi-layer bandages, but they're certainly useful in terms of clinical practice. And again, if you look at this patient's leg here, we need to really think about what is his best option in terms of compression therapy. When I look at that leg, I think that a compression wrap system isn't going to give the amount of compression I need on the foot. It's probably going to dig in at the level of that ulcer. It's certainly not going to help that venous eczema that's on the sole of his foot and on the top area of his leg. Actually, if I put on a hosiery kit, that's going to be very uncomfortable going over all of those areas of eczema. So when I look at that patient, that patient I think would be best served from a period of time in compression bandaging but at the same time as a topical application of something to help to control the eczema. So when I talk about the treatment of eczema, what are these treatments? Well, the first thing is emollients. Good hydration of your skin is your cornerstone at actually preventing eczema, keeping that skin healthy and managing the eczema on a long-term basis. Once you start to get that irritation, you can use mild topical steroids, if required, moderate topical steroids or even potent topical steroids. We can sometimes use oral uh, cortisones, uh, but really we tend to use those only in the most severe. And with any steroid, we need to think about the time of frame that it can be used for. As skin thinning can occur over a long sustained period. I think the thing that we often stop thinking about is actually oral antihistamines. If a patient's got a significant itch, and oral antihistamine can be highly effective for that. But actually there's two great treatments topically for eczema, that being topical zinc and topical calamine. So this session today really is gonna focus on that calamine. So calamine is fantastic. And I say that because it's a combination of the zinc that we've known and used for a long period of time with that iron oxide. And that it's the iron in the calamine that gives it that beautiful pink color. And the beauty of the combination of these two um, uh, uh, oxides really is that you get an astringic agent in terms from the zinc. So an astringic agent helps to dry things up. So if you've got weeping eczema, it helps to dry that up. And also you get an anti-itch effect, if you like, from the ferrous oxide. So you get that lovely calming effect, that smoothing effect at the same time as drying that venous eczema up. 
it's really old. It's been used uh, for, for many, many years. And actually we have uh, empirical evidence reported from patients that actually the use of topical calamine helps to reduce itching, skin irritation, stinging and burning sensations. The problem is with calamine is that, you know, how do you actually apply it to a patient with venous eczema? And then even if you applied it out of a bottle of a lotion today, how long that's going to last? And actually, that's the beauty of when you're able to get compression systems that's impregnated already with that topical treatment for your venous eczema. It therefore becomes so easy to apply, much less mess. And it's that combination of that perfect compression with that com perfect skin control and skin preparation. I personally use Andaflex Calamine within my clinical practice, and I find it a great help in managing these patients with venous eczema. We have got evidence to show that it actually helps to improve the itch control. Patients do report that cool and smoothing and soothing and comfortable effect. And I must say, every single patient that I apply this to, their first reaction when you put this bandage on is, oh, that feels lovely. And if you can think about being that patient with that irritated venous eczema and the start of that venous ulcer, we really need to think of how we're going to calm down that skin. It is going to be terribly sore and terribly itchy. So this is a case that from, from my clinic. You can see on the left-hand side that actually we tried to manage this patient with zinc. And many of you may be aware of the zinc products that's out there. And, and you know, I used to use quite a few of these. The problem is, is with the traditional zinc type paste bandages that came separate from the compression systems, is that they could dry out the skin very effectively. In fact, too effectively. And quite often they can adhere themselves to the actual skin itself that's ulcerated or, as it's done here, cause that cobblestone effect of where we've really put zinc on that dry skin. And actually, are we helping the situation or are we made things worse? You can see by using a combination of zinc or calomile induced bandages as well that comes with the compression, you can see how you can manage both the eczema the dry skin and the compression all in one to give you this perfect solution. There's quite a bit of evidence out there. This is a poster that was produced by Wendy Cole. I appreciate you won't be able to read the size of the text on this, but it really does show, um, it's not just me saying this, there are other clinicians out there that's really seen the benefit. And if you contact um, wound care today or uh, the H&R rep, I'm sure that they'll be able to send you a copy of this poster. So um, we're nearly at the end of my session and I just want to say really why is this so important and you will have all heard about antimicrobial stewardship and the fact that we are using antibiotics quite often. In fact 16% of all antibiotic prescriptions are for wound care. I do think antimicrobial resistance is potentially going to happen in our lifetime. I think we've all just been through what it's like to have a disease with no known cure. That first year of how to manage patients with COVID was terribly scary when you didn't know how to treat them or had any effective therapies to treat that infection. But imagine in the future if we don't have any effective therapies for a pseudomonas, for a cellulitis, for a throat infection, for a pneumonia, then we will be facing real trouble. All of these patients within this slide set all received antibiotics and none of them had an infected process. So the top patient is a contact dermatitis, they've got an allergic reaction, you can see that by the true linear lines. The one on the right hand side is bilateral uh, venous inflammation, um, you've got that inflammatory response, but that's not infective. It won't respond to antibiotics. All those bottom pictures were all treated for wound infections and none of them had a, had a wound infection. All they had was poorly controlled and poorly managed venous eczema. So really, if you get this right, you can really help in terms of that wider issue, in terms of that antimicrobial stewardship. You can help to prevent a really fearful pandemic of the future. 
So just to summarise, what I'd say to you is assess every patient that you've got who you're seeing with a lower limb condition for venous eczema. If they've got a venous ulcer, they're probably going to have some venous eczema at the same time. You need to be thinking about what is the key to that skin reaction. Is it a contact dermatitis allergic reaction or is it venous hypertension? And hopefully from this, I've given you more confidence of how to diagnose venous hypertension. You need to think about how you're going to treat that venous hypertension in combination with that skin directly, because that way it really helps to improve patient's comfort and their adherence to that compression therapy. The earlier we do this, the better. The earlier the intervention, the less risk of infection, the less risk of inappropriate management. And we really need to be thinking of if you've got a patient with an area of ulceration, be aware of that venous eczema. Think about looking in other areas and think about knowing what you are treating. And ultimately, know your treatment options. Think about putting yourself in that patient's position. Think about how sore and how itchy that skin would be and how beautiful it would be to have a treatment that your reaction is, ooh, that's lovely. So early intervention is the key. I hope you've found this session informative. I'm going to hand you over now uh, to Sharon, who's just going to give you a little bit more information about um, the, the specific product in terms of Andaflex TLC. Sharon, over to you. Thank you. So obviously, as Leanne has already alluded to, um, the Andaflex Calamine Kit is an all-in-one solution for your patients with venous eczema and other irritated skin conditions. As you can see from the slide, layer one gives you a clue. It's a two layer system. So layer one is the really soft and um, low profile foam layer that's impregnated with the calamine. Obviously, as we've already seen in some of Leanne's cases, it gives a really soothing effect to relieve the itch that your patients feel from bandaging and or venous eczema itself. Obviously going back to the, ooh, that feels really nice comment. Because the foam's impregnated with the solution, it's really easy to apply. It's not messy. It's not messy to you or your patient. It's very, very easy to apply to the limb. It's lightweight and low profile. So obviously in conjunction with um, layer two, your patients are able to wear normal footwear, which is really important, isn't it? For them maintaining uh, their mobility, keeping that calf muscle pump active, which obviously Leanne's talked about when talking about venous hypertension and associated problems. And obviously, more importantly, that they're able to continue with their activities of normal daily living. So layer two is your compression layer. Um, and that comes in um, light, and standard or full and reduced compression, depending on which terminology you use. Um, both versions of compression have, like you can see in the image there, the visual indicators on them to guide effective compression application. Obviously with all compression bandaging, they should only ever be applied by somebody who is clinically trained to do so. When you open the layer two, you'll see um, the indicators on the compression layer and they look like rugby balls or eggs, depending on which way you're looking at the, at the bandage. They're a rugby ball on the side or they're an egg stood up. Once you apply that compression layer at the correct level of compression, your indicators will change from being that strange oval shape to a really nice circle shape. If you apply the compression too tightly, then you'll reverse your oval shape so it'll kind of go the other way to how they looked in the beginning. The compression layer is hand tearable, so you're not needing to worry about needing scissors. You really can um, tear that, that layer too once you've obviously applied fully to the limb. Like I say, in relation to layer one and um, the foam layer, the, it's really low profile, really comfortable on the patient's leg. The Andaflex Calamine range comes with a unique non-slip moisture resistant cohesion. So that makes it so that it's able to stick to that moist foam layer really effectively, which obviously prevents slippage down the limb. And obviously both layers are latex free. In terms of ordering details, Andaflex Calamine is available at FP10 um, and is now also available um, on NHS supply chain and that went live on the 14th of March. So that makes it easier um, in terms of accessing um, the different bandages. So the Calamine standard and the Calamine light. 
So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Leanne for her um, excellent and informative session. Um, it, it was it's so interesting. I love listening to her speak and I really hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Obviously, if you are interested in um, finding out more information about Andaflex Calamine or interested in um, conducting an evaluation within your clinical area, then obviously please get in touch with us at HR Healthcare using the uh, marketing at hrhealthcare.co.uk um, email address. So I'm going to hand you back now to Alec um, so that we are available to take any questions if you've had any during the session. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Leanne. Uh, very informative, as always. Uh, I noticed a couple of people saying, Leanne, that uh, the the Venus versus arterial presentation was uh, was really clear, and I thought the same thing. I think the pictures that you uh, you used made it uh, made it made it particularly clear. Um, we've had loads of questions coming in, so do keep asking them if you are if you're still watching at home. We um, I, I say this all the time, but if uh, if we don't get through to them. Um, this evening, we will create a document which will go online uh, along with a copy of the presentation and the slides for you to download. So we will get through to every question at some point, but there's quite a lot that have come through now. Um, I've got one just for uh, you, Sharon, just quickly, just one of my own, which is, um, uh, th this may sound a bit silly, actually, but um, is the, you know, the, the Andaflex isn't used as a prophylaxis. It, you, you don't use it instead of other compression products or is it you're only recommending it for when there is um, a skin condition as, as, well, as well as compression needed? Yes. Sorry, Alec, I'm still trying to process right, your question. So the Andaflex Calamine is yeah. obviously a compression bandage um, with the added benefit of obviously having the Calamine impregnated foam layer to, to, to manage and, and soothe those varicose um, eczema, venous eczema affected legs. Okay, brilliant. But I, I think, think I think you bring up a great point, Alec, that really the best way to manage this is to prevent it ever from coming in the first place. So, you know, when we start to search, show signs and symptoms of that venous disease, that edema, those initial skin changes, it's then when we should be thinking about using compression therapy like compression hosiery to keep it at that point. It's only when we fail to do that, if you like, that when we start to progress to skin venous eczema and venous ulceration it's then when we need these types of combination products yeah i think that's what i was trying to get at is it you know is it recommended for just use where there's just compression required or you only is it only recommended for when there's compression and skin uh you know skin damage that you know whether it's a venous whether it's venous eczema or, or, or anything else is that it but i think you've uh, i think you've both just covered that um yeah and, and, I, and what, what i'd say is that you know for a large proportion of patients with venous ulceration they'll have venous eczema at the same time so okay. you know it's about thinking of what is that surrounding skin condition if you've got an isolated venous leg ulcer and the rest of the skin is absolutely lovely just use a normal compression therapy but if you've got that um, um, or if the patient's saying it's warm it's itchy it's irritating me try this even if they've got no skin damage because patients love it but if you've got that skin damage at the same time that skin irritation that's the sweet spot i think of this product Brilliant. Uh, I'm going to move on to the uh, questions from the audience because we've got tons of them. So I'm going to try and keep you keep you giving me short and snappy answers where possible so that we can try and get through as many of them as possible. Uh, the first one is from Tony Brim. And this is to you, Leanne. This is, could venous inflammation also lead to sepsis with increased white blood cell activity? No. Um, so, that's the answer, Tony. They're, they're, they're yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll just say, so the venous inflammation is an inflammatory, not an infected sepsis is infection so it has to have a form of bacterial invasion at the same time so a staph or a strep infection venous inflammation is just your normal body's activation so completely separate brilliant thank you for that uh another one this is from liz sanders uh do you have any tips on the best way to manage heavy exudate in legs with severe venous eczema i'll come to you both for that do you want to maybe take that to start sharon well, I was going to say, yeah, uh, Leanne can take that one first. because she's Okay, Leanne, you can take that one first. <laughs> so I, I think first off, identify what's your underlying cause. If you've definitely ruled out arterial disease and you know that for a definite, you've got a beautiful ABPI of one, a palpable foot pulse, you've no problems with that. The reason why your extra date still high is because you're not getting enough compression. On. So you need to increase the levels of compression. We talk about strong compression. But if you speak to anybody who, who plays in compression on a regular basis, 
that's a minimum of 40, maybe 50, maybe 60. So you need to be getting that strong compression therapy on in combination with those skin preparations. So, you know, if you are using like calamine um, products from H&R, you know, if you're using that and you've still got a large volumes of extra and a large limb, you might need a secondary bandage on top to actually increase the amount of compression that you're getting onto that leg. Obviously, this is all off license practice, and that's why Sharon battered that over to me. <laughs> um, but high volumes of exudate means yeah. one thing you're not enough yeah. compression on. Okay. Do you want to add anything to that, Sharon? No, I knew that Leanne would give a really honest answer. And I know that we do see in, in pockets of areas, don't they? Some people are very cautious about putting levels of compression even below what we'd expect as standard. So I, I knew that Leanne would give, um, give an honest answer to that question. And, and I think, Alec, that, that, that Sharon says a really good point that, you know, a lot of people aren't confident with this. So, uh, you know, after today's session, I don't want you all to be mavericks and going out there to put 60, 70 milligrams of mercury pressure on. But I want you to know the patient's failing in the current system. I can only feel comfortable of putting 40 on. I've still got a bigger dermatous leg with high volumes of extra day. I'm going to escalate. I'm going to refer on. Escalation to another clinician is not failure of care. If anything, it's a marker of excellent care. You're identifying it's falling outside of my skill set. Yeah. Okay. Um, Sharon, you mentioned about the uh, the underflex calamine. Then the 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 layer that has um, the layer that's the foam layer. Um, is that it, it? Does it or can it um, absorb enough exudate for it to fall into the category that we'd be saying that it manages heavy exudate? Because I'm just thinking that in a lot of cases we hear about uh, clinicians who, uh, you know, make sandwiches with dressings and things, you know, put super absorbers and things under there. And the moment you do that, then doesn't the benefit of the of the actual calamine element of that, because um, it's not touching the skin, it's on the back of a dressing that, that that you sort of lose that. So I'm just wondering what what we what you'd consider to be. This is a very specific question. I don't want to dwell on it too much, but. It's a very specific question around high exudate and the venous eczema. So does the, the foam, foam layer have absorbency? Yeah, does the foam layer, would the foam, is, does the, is the foam layer enough for the clinician to avoid having to stick other foam dressings or super absorbers underneath? It's not, it's not something you can answer that really because it depends on the, the level of the exudate that's coming from the patient, you know, Obviously, going back to the other question that Leanne's just answered, you could have masses, you know, like exudate just pouring out of legs before your eyes. So, you know, there may be times when actually that there are breaks in the skin where you need a super absorbent dressing or you need something else to absorb that exudate from that area. I don't know if Leanne has got anything different. So, so from my clinical practice, you're absolutely right, Alec. This product only works when it's in contact with the skin. Yeah, yeah that's what I was getting at. If you put a dressing on the area, you're not going to get the benefit. So actually, what you need to do is to put this directly onto the skin and then control the exudate by putting a super absorbent after the calamine layer before the second layer. Yeah. And therefore, you're going to get that wicking effect of controlling that exudate. But this stuff has to be in combination with the venous eczema. You don't have to be in contact with the venous ulcer, but certainly the area of venous eczema. Okay, brilliant. Uh, thank you for that. That certainly makes it clear for me, and I hope that makes it clear for Liz, who's asked the question. Uh, the next question is from Karen Shaw. Uh, would you suggest a topical steroid to the peri wound area and surrounding irritated skin? It says it's to, to, to Leanne again, if you want to take that. Yeah, you know, you can you can treat venous eczema by any form of topical preparation. You can use topical steroids. Be careful, of course, of the thinning of the skin and the long term use. You can use topical zinc. You can use topical calamine. There is no empirical evidence to say one of those is better. I can tell you anecdotally that my patients prefer the calamine because of the ooh effect that they get. You don't get that ooh effect with when you put some hydrocortisone on around the wound. So it all just depends really on what are you treating. If you're treating just visible venous eczema, try a, try a topical steroid. If you're treating painful, irritated venous eczema, then that's where I think you'd be falling to a different product. Okay. Uh, there's another question here from Sonia, which says, um, which sort of goes back to the previous question we were talking about. So this says, do dressings, in, in your opinion, under compression aggravate venous eczema? They can do, yeah. Yeah, 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 they can do. Many dressings can, especially 
things like um, foam dressings. So, you know, where you get that bit of moisture underneath, you can get that irritation, especially you'll have seen it. You get the irritation around the bar there. If you're using adhesive dressings on venous leg ulcers, you often get an area, a perfect square border, if you like, of venous eczema. And yeah, they can really irritate it. So it's just thinking about what products do you need? Do you, if you've got intact skin, do you need a barrier product to help to protect that skin from actually suffering that breakdown? If you've already got that breakdown, how are you going to manage that venous eczema? Like we said, you're going to do that compression in combination with some form of topical product. Okay. Uh, Sharon, the next question is for you, but I think it's the question that I asked you pretty much at the start. I think somebody's obviously got the same thought as me. And this was, uh, when would you choose an Andaflex TLC calamine bandage over another type of compression system? So yeah, obviously it's a simpler question than what you asked, Alec. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah you, you, obviously going back to like the case studies that Leanne covered, you know, you'd use the calamine when you've got that really irritated, really inflamed, um, you know, skin that you'd use that over a dry, you know, compression system. Okay, that leads nicely on to the next one. This is, uh, this is for Leanne again. How often should compression be changed when acute venous eczema is present? Okay, so the, the products that are all designed, they're all designed to last for seven days. Wherever possible, we should be trying to get seven days wear time out of them. When I say designed for seven days, most systems are designed to deliver sustained compression over that period of time. So you're wanting to try to get weekly dressing changes because the biggest burden of managing a patient with any form of venous disease is us. We're the most costly of all of this, especially if you work in community with the price of fuel at this moment in time. It's costing each oh, and no. every individual nurse to treat a patient. But I'll come off my political soapbox for that. <laughs> so the answer is it, there's no right and wrong. It's an individual patient assessment. How frequent compression therapy gets changed depends on what you're trying to treat, the volumes of the exudate. Truthfully, with the calamine, if you've got a significant area of irritated venous eczema, I'd probably do, do you twice a week to get that reapplication of that calamine. If I'm treating a small area that's getting under control, I'll get you to go weaker. Okay. Um, this next question is from Adam, uh, and this is, at what point do we go to zinc? I'm new to community nursing and have a few patients in zinc oxide impregnated dressings. Do you want to take that one, Leanne, again? So, the, the, as, 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 as I've said, there's no empirical evidence to say steroids, zinc, or calamine is better than the other. So, if your patient that you're on zinc already, you're managing their eczema well, the things are getting better, I would not say change to calamine, you've already got a good management plan in place. But if that patient is starting to fail on zinc, and I've seen many patients starting to fail on zinc because you tend to get that drying out of that surrounding skin plaques, if you like, around it, especially with the zinc impregnated bandages or like the tubey fasty type things that's impregnated with zinc, trying to avoid brand names of other people's stuff. But stuff like that can really dry out a leg. So I think it all depends on what you're finding. You know, if you've got a management plan that's working, don't change it. There's no empirical evidence to say that's better than what you're doing. But if you're still finding that you've got, you're not controlling the eczema, the patient's not overly impressed or still complaining of discomfort or itching, then think about using this product as an alternative. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Um, we're going to move on to the final question, just simply because uh, we're running um, we're running out of time um, and the questions are coming through thick and fast. We've got about 800 people watching this evening. So that's, uh, that's thank you very much again for uh, for joining us. Uh, the final question is for you, Sharon. And this is, are there any uh, clinical studies around uh, on the use of calamine? So obviously, Leanne showed the, the poster that was um, developed in Kent. We've also got a, a study called the Apricot Study. Um, and we are obviously, like I said in the call to action slide, we're obviously in the process of doing various different studies around the country at the moment. And like I say, if you are in an area where you feel you'd be interested to get involved in any of the current studies or any new ones, then please do get in touch with us because we're obviously always interested in adding to those sort of um, plethora of studies. Brilliant. And if you are interested in uh, seeing the product or learning more about it, then uh... H&R will be joining us at Wound Care today in Milton Keynes on the 28th and 29th of uh, this month. So that's a week Monday. So do come along. We've still got spaces available. 
There should be a link on your screen now for how you can sign up to that event. Um, Sharon, Leanne, thank you very much again. And uh, a huge thank you to H&R um, who, uh, who have supported this event. Uh, for all you watching, you'll be able to download your certificate. As I said, uh, the link should be on your screen any moment. Um, tomorrow, you'll be able to get a copy of the, uh, a copy of the presentation via our website as well as being able to re-watch this and share this link uh, via Facebook with any of your colleagues that you think may be interested in, uh, in, in, in watching the presentation also. Uh, thank you very much to my team behind the scenes. Uh, we'll be back next Tuesday, so come back and join us then for another event. And uh, I think that's it for me. So thank you very much, ladies. Have a good evening and thank you very much, everyone at home, for joining us. Good night. <laughs>